While our world is ever-changing, there exists an enduring and ever-present issue that impacts millions of lives daily. Poverty. We all think we know what poverty is and what it means, but do we really? Poverty is more than simply income lowness. It is a multifaceted concept bigger than mere numbers. It intertwines basic necessities, opportunities, freedom, and most of all, human dignity. So what exactly is poverty? How do we go about measuring and defining it? In this video, we will unravel the many facets of poverty, examining several distinct approaches to measuring it, the OPM, the SPM, the capabilities approach, and Rector's argument, to ultimately argue what we think is the best, most accurate, and most inclusive way to measure poverty. Poverty is a lack of the sufficient income, resources, and opportunities necessary to achieve personal freedom and success in today's modern society. To measure poverty, we decided to use the SPM as well as the capabilities approach. We think poverty should be measured by combining a more concrete and metric measurement of poverty, the supplemental mo poverty measure, with a more abstract and hol holistic measurement, the capabilities approach. We think adding the capabilities approach into the SPM will account for factors that income and other statistics cannot necessarily show and better represent each individual's circumstances and abilities. Our method balances accuracy with inclusivity and adds subjectivity to clear quantitative measurement. Before we dive into what we think is the best way to measure poverty, we will review the, review the current standard of measurement in the United States, the OPM, or the Official Poverty Measure. The OPM estimates how many people are unable to afford necessities without government assistance. This measurement is based on the average national cost of food from the 1960s, but is adjusted every year to reflect inflation. The Census Bureau determines who is in poverty by comparing pre-tax income to a threshold set to three times the cost of a food basket threshold is also adjusted depending on family size and composition. While this method sets a clear threshold and is easy to measure across time and across different communities, we think that it does not accurately represent the needs of modern life or other factors such as non-cash government benefits, geographical differences, and non-nuclear family structures. We think that the OPM is outdated and does not capture the complex nature of poverty in our day and age. In order to better represent an ever-changing society in which people have different needs and abilities, we believe it is important to incorporate a holistic and all-inclusive approach into our measurement. That said, it's also important to have a clear way of measuring who is in poverty and who is not. To create a method that allows for both, we will begin with the supplemental poverty measure as our baseline. The supplemental poverty measure looks at pre-tax income, like the OPM, but it also adds non-cash benefits, both in-kind and near-cash benefits, such as tax credits. Additionally, it subtracts non-discretionary expenses like taxes and medical expenses. We like this method better than the OPM because it factors in important things besides pre-tax income, like government benefits. Two families could have identical incomes, but one could receive government benefits and the other could not. By the OPM standard, the families are experiencing the same level of poverty. According to the SPM, on the other hand, the one with the government benefits is considered to be doing better than the one without. The threshold of the SPM is the 33rd percentile of necessary spending times 1.2, or the bottom tertiale of people spending money on food, clothes, shelter, utilities, and telephone, telephone and internet times 20% to represent additional necessities. We think that the SPM well represents the necessities of modern life and accounts for non-cash benefits, familial and geographical differences, and other things that the OPM left out. Additionally, the SPM acknowledges that the world is always changing and so is the standard of living in the U.S. We will incorporate much of the SPM into our final measurement of poverty, but there are certain shortcomings we want to, we want to address. The SPM is meant to provide a more all-encompassing method of measurement, but we believe that it still does not fully leave room for the needs of each individual. For example, if two individuals have the same income, government benefits, and FCSUTI spending, but one individual has a severe disability that prevents them from having the same quality of life and opportunities, the SPM still considers them to be at an equal poverty level. For this reason, we turn to the capabilities approach to fill the gap left by the SPM. The capabilities approach, developed by Amartya Sen and further expanded upon by Martha Nussbaum, focuses on the idea that poverty should not be solely measured by income or material deprivation, but should instead be assessed by an individual's capabilities and opportunities to lead a life they have reason to value. While many approaches to poverty focus on an individual's functionings or things that they have been achieved or capabilities that have been realized, this approach focuses on capabilities, the 
potential doings and beings that people can achieve if they so choose. For example, someone could lack the capability to afford education, preventing th them from the functioning of a good education. Conversely, someone could have all the money in the world, all of the capabilities, but choose not to use it, therefore not resulting in a functioning. The capabilities approach accounts for the fact that income is not the only way to achieve a function and not everyone has the same capabilities. This not only protects the individual needs of each person, but it also focuses on the freedom they have in their lives or lack thereof. We want to employ this method of thinking about poverty to our final way of measurement, but the capabilities approach lacks a clear quantitative way of measuring poverty. It presents a spectrum of capabilities and allows us to assume who has enough of what, but there is no way to know where the threshold line is. Therefore, we think that the best way to use the capabilities approach is, a, is to apply it to another method of measurement, specifically the SPM. To create our method of measurement, we will use the SPM as baseline. So, in terms of resources, we are talking about pre-tax income plus, no, plus non-cash benefits minus non-discretionary expenses. However, we then subtract an individual's lack of capabilities, such as those relating to bodily integrity, bodily health, sense, imagination, and thought, and political th freedom. We imagine an index with multiple thresholds. One will be that of the SPM, and the other will be more abstract and will measure capability. If someone's capability measurement is not comparable to their measurement on the SPM threshold, their place will change accordingly. Therefore, somebody's poverty measure according to the SPM will be lowered if they are disabled, living in a high crime neighborhood, or lacking access to education. While this adds an abstract and subjective measurement to our equation, we think it would better represent those in poverty. This way, if we are comparing two individuals in poverty and one of them is disabled, they will fall lower past the poverty threshold line. Although we believe that our method of measuring poverty is the best way to represent each individual human being, we acknowledge that there are shortcomings to our argument. Involving the capabilities approach at all will complicate units of measurement by adding abstract, intangible factors into the equation. Robert Rector's argument in his article, Air Conditioning, Cable TV, and an Xbox, What is Poverty in the U.S. Today?, focuses primarily on material aspects, aspects when measuring poverty. He suggests that many people considered to be in poverty by government standards have access to material amenities like air conditioning, refrigerators, and TVs, and meet their basic needs. Through this argument, he claims obscure, non-material considerations when thinking about poverty causes misinformation and exaggeration, creating misconceptions about poverty in the U.S. Our argument does not dismiss the importance of material aspects in income, but it also seeks to expand the understanding of poverty by considering factors beyond those things. Rector's argument may be easier c to conceptualize and measure, but it does not offer the comprehensive approach needed to address the diverse needs and capabilities of those in poverty. For example, one could have a refrigerator and not necessarily have food, electricity, etc. Rector measures poverty with material possessions, which does not leave room for other non-material factors. We decided to utilize AI after we had determined what we thought was best to measure poverty. We were curious to see what AI would come up with, but we wanted to write our own thesis before being swayed by AI. After all of this, we prompted AI to tell us what the best combination of the different measurements of poverty is to best protect human dignity. It turned out that AI agreed with us, saying that SPM was the best measurement to use, but that it is beneficial to combine approaches that consider both income and non-income factors. In conclusion, our method of measuring poverty includes both concrete and quantitative factors as a result of the SPM, and abstract factors due to the capabilities approach. When we asked AI for its opinion, we stressed that we wanted a method that would protect and emphasize the dignity of all human beings. Using this key phrase, we were not surprised that AI agreed with us, and we think you should too.